Uh, so Titan A has been doing a lot of interesting work connecting quantum theory, category theory, and the analysis of language and of concepts. And this is the kind of highly interdisciplinary work that applied category theorists love. It's great going to conferences where people are talking about such mixes of ideas and actually having a common enough language that they can understand each other. Uh, and so Tide Enable introduce us to some of her work today. So thanks. All right. Uh, thanks, John, for the introduction and also the invitation. Um, so right, there's a lot of ideas in here. Uh, kind of, I'm going to pull from ideas involving linear algebra and probability, basic probability theory, and a little bit of category theory and a little bit of machine learning. So I was telling John uh, before we started that I could really spend like an hour telling you about each of those aspects, but I will try to uh, refrain from that and maybe just give a more uh, high level overview of how these ideas are sort of connecting. Um, and also as a small disclaimer, I have mentioned some of the work that you'll see here in um, previous talks and previous seminars, so some of it might seem familiar, but I thought it'd be good um, to get everyone on the same page to start, sort of give a background overview. So um, let me tell you what to expect uh, going forward. So um, I want to start by giving an example. Um, I want to give an example of a really basic feature in probability theory. Um, this example will then motivate some of the theory that I want to tell you about, the sort of um, meat of this talk. So that's sort of part one. Um, then I'd like to show how you can see this theory in, in, in action with an application. Um, and then I'll connect that to something that maybe is uh, familiar to people uh, in the language of category theory, something called formal concepts. And then if I have time at the end, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my motivation. So um, Everything I'm going to tell you today can be found in my thesis, which is now in the archive. And if I have time at the end, I can tell you a little bit about the title. Um, so I realize that this outline is a little bit backwards. I'm going to start with an example and end with motivation, but I think hopefully it'll work out. Okay, so uh, just to, just to um, warm us up, here's a thought uh, I want to dwell on for a little bit. So here's something that's familiar to everyone. Uh, really basic probability theory. So if you have a joint probability distribution. This gives rise to marginal probability distributions. And here's the idea I'd like to think about for a little bit. And that is that the process of marginalizing loses information. So I think this is familiar. Um, but I actually want to show a concrete example of this to motivate some of the ideas I want to talk about in a little bit. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'd like to consider, a, we'll, we'll consider a joint probability distribution and let's just think of finite sets uh, for this talk. So I mean a, a real valued function on a product of finite sets x and y. Um, so non-negative numbers that add up to one. And so you know, of course, you can fix one of these sets like y and uh, quote unquote integrate out that complementary set. And so this defines a marginal probability distribution on the other set x. And what's the probability marginal probability of a little element x while well, you just sum probabilities over this uh, complementary set y. And so the idea I'd like to illustrate is that this process of marginalizing or summing out y causes information about y to be lost. So let's see a really simple example. Here I have three phrases of length two, um, orange fruit, green fruit, purple vegetable. Now, I would like to think of orange, green, and purple as forming uh, one set X. And let's think of fruit and vegetable as forming another set Y. And let's think of these uh, three phrases or three pairs as a subset of the Cartesian product. And I just wanna look at the probability distribution that's uniformly concentrated on this three element subset. So here's the joint distribution. I've written it as a two by three table. So the probability of a pear color food is one third if that pair is on the previous slide and it's zero otherwise. And then you know, marginal, you compute marginal probabilities by summing along rows and columns of the table. So the marginal probability for orange, green, and purple each is one third. Um, 
marginal probability for fruit is two thirds and for vegetable is one third. Okay, nothing new, but here's the point I'd like to emphasize. Marginal probability does not have memory. So the marginal probability of fruit is two thirds, but that number doesn't tell us this additional color, uh, color distribution on fruit, namely that half are orange and half are green, right? We've lost information about colors because we've marginalized that out. And similarly, the marginal probability of vegetable is one third, but that number doesn't tell us anything about the colors of vegetables, namely that all of them are purple. And so marginal probability is like a summary uh, or summarization. And so by default, you're just losing some details from your joint distribution, right? This is familiar. Why do I mention this? Because I wanna show you another way now. I'd like to show you another way to compute marginal probability distributions in such a way that you have easy access to the information that's lost when marginalizing the usual way. So let me rewind now. And what's the starting ingredient? Well, the first ingredient, again, you just have a joint distribution. So remember we had that two by three table. So let me show that to you again. So here's our joint probability distribution, except I have made some small cosmetic changes. First, the table now is a matrix, which I'm calling M. And also, um, I have judiciously added some square roots, which I will not explain yet, but I will later. So here's a modified version of our joint distribution. And now I want to do something um, a little bit unmotivated, but I'll explain why later. I'd like to now multiply this matrix by its transpose or adjoint. So if I do that, I end up with a three by three matrix. And this matrix has a few interesting features. Um, first of all, it's three by three. Not coincidentally, the set X of colors has three elements in it. Um, in fact, if I think of X as an ordered set with the ordering shown earlier, orange, green, purple, I can even imagine uh, associating or, or um, mapping those colors with each one of these columns and rows. And so if you do that, you can see another interesting feature of this matrix, namely it's diagonal. So if you look at these diagonal entries, these are exactly the marginal probability distribution uh, that we computed a few minutes ago. So I just shown you another way to compute marginals. You take a joint probability distribution, you write it as a matrix in this kind of funky way, and then you multiply the matrix by its adjoint. And then voila, you recover marginals on the diagonal. Okay, but here's what's interesting, is that this matrix also has non-zero off diagonal entries. Okay, so the orange green entry is a third. Um, not coincidentally, orange and green both describe fruit. The orange purple entry is zero. Not coincidentally, there is no food which was both orange and purple, just pointing that out. Um, so what about these off diagonals? Well, their presence guarantees that this three by three matrix has interesting spectral information. So you can see this is a rank two matrix. And so it has two eigenvectors, not coincidentally, the set Y, remember, containing fruit and vegetable, also has two elements in it. So on the next slide, let me uh, show you a suggestive interpretation of how the two eigenvectors of this matrix relate to the two elements of Y. So here's the suggestive interpretation. If you look at the squares of the entries of these eigenvectors, they define conditional probability distributions on the set X of colors. So for, for example, if we look at this first eigenvector here, well, what's the square of the first entry? Okay, it's one half, which is precisely the conditional probability of finding the word orange, given that the word that it's describing is fruit. And then similarly for all of the other entries, um, you know, what's the conditional probability that I'm gonna find purple given that the word that it's describing is fruit? Well, it's zero, none of our fruit were purple. And then the same thing, I can look at the second eigenvector uh, of this three by three matrix, 
um, it corresponds to 0, 0, 001, uh, which defines the conditional probability. Now I'm conditioned on the second element of my set Y, vegetable. All of the vegetables were purple. So here we have exactly the information that um, you don't have access to in marginalizing in the usual way. And so um, remember these eigenvectors. I have a note to myself to tell you, okay, remember these eigenvectors because they're going to appear a little bit later on in the talk. So that's the end of the, the example. Um, and now I want to tell you what is this an example of? Uh, what's really going on behind the scenes? So here's sort of a general recipe that I'm following. Suppose you have any probability distribution pi um, on, uh, on uh, finite sets x cross y and define a matrix M by exactly what we just did. Look at the square roots of the, these joint probabilities and just sort of form them into a rectangular array. Um, so now what I'd like to do, I'm gonna use the same letter M to denote the linear map uh, corresponding to this matrix. So I'm thinking of M as the linear map represented by this matrix. I'd like to think of M as going from X to Y, which is why I'm indexing the rows by Y and the columns by X, but um, that's just a small, a small detail. So here's kind of the punchline. If I look at this linear map from CX to CY, by the way, uh, I should say, by CX, I mean the free vector space whose basis is X. So um, under the usual inner product, just think of the elements of X as forming an orthonormal basis for this space. And so what's interesting is that if we look at this map composed with its linear adjoint, uh, you get an operator on the X subsystem, CX to itself, or if you compose in the other direction, if I apply the adjoint first and then go back, I get an operator on the Y subsystem, on CY. And um, the claim is that these two operators are special in a sense that I'm going to make precise in a little bit. So the bulk of this talk really is going to be focusing on these two eigenvectors. We've just seen that their eigenvectors capture something pretty interesting. And so I want to get into that um, a little bit later on. So claim is that these operators are special. In what sense are they special? Let me tell you two two things, and then um, I'll explain this in, in a few minutes. So number one, I like to think of these two operators, M dagger M and M M dagger, as like the linear algebraic or quantum versions of marginal probability distributions. That's number one. Number two, I also like to think of their spectral information as something akin to or tantamount to conditional probability. So I wanna take the time to explain that so you can see that in a really concrete way. But first, I, I have to tell you that this is all part of a much larger story, namely a passage from classical to quantum probability. So I could really omit this part of the talk, but I actually think it's helpful um, to know that something deeper is going on. After all, it takes no work to have a probability distribution and then just add, you know, like take square roots and put this in a rectangular array. That takes no work. So um, what's really going on? So there's something much, much deeper and we're only focusing on a small part of this. So allow me to just pause for a little bit and tell you what is this larger story. So um, what's really going on is that there's, I, I'm looking at a very particular passage from classical to what's called quantum probability. So here's the sort of um, uh, scheme or recipe or sketch uh, of what one can do. So um, anytime you have a probability distribution on finite sets x cross y, there's a way to get a particular linear operator operator on um, the free vector space generated by those sets. But this is isomorphic to the tensor product CX tensor CY. So there's a way to start with a probability distribution and get a linear operator on this tensor product. Now, and so this is like a passage from sets to vector spaces, essentially. Now, just like in the set world, just like you can compute marginal probability, so I can get a probability distribution on X alone, there's a linear algebraic analog to this. So there's a way to start with an operator on this tensor product and you know, quote unquote, integrate out or trace out Y 
to get uh, an operator on CX alone. And what's special about this operator down here is that it recovers this original uh, classical marginal probability distribution in a precise way. And um, we're living down here. Okay, so this, this talk is focused down here, but just know it's part of this larger story. Now, um, let me say a little bit more because this operator up here is quite special. You know, like any linear operator, no, a very particular kind. So um, in linear algebra, the name for a linear operator that's like a probability distribution is called a density operator. So I, let me not give you the definition, uh, or if someone knows, you can maybe write it in the chat to help others. Uh, but I just want to think of this for this talk as just the linear algebraic version of a probability distribution. Um, and actually, it's not even hard to describe. So let me, you know, how do you start with a finite list of numbers and even get a linear map? So let me just describe this in words. Suppose you're over here, you have pi, right? Pi is just a finite list of numbers that add up to one, non-negative. So you can think of this finite list of numbers as uh, defining a point in finite dimensional space. Okay, namely this space right here. So now imagine you have this point in complex Euclidean space, and you can think of a vector that goes from the origin and ends at the tip of that point, right? So now think of the lines spanned by this vector and consider orthogonal projection onto that line. That's exactly uh, the density operator. I haven't defined that yet, but that's the linear operator that I have in mind. And it happens to satisfy some nice properties that allow us to think of as a generalization of pi. So it's a rank one linear operator. Um, in the words of um, quantum mechanics, den density operators are also called quantum states. And so the fact that ours is a rank one operator, another word for this is a pure quantum state. So um, essentially what we're doing is we're starting with one of these pure quantum states and we're applying this linear algebraic version of marginalizing. Um, by the way, that's an operation in linear algebra called the partial trace. So I'm applying the partial trace to one of these operators. And it turns out that in the end, when you do that, the image under this tracing out action uh, is exactly one of these M dagger M operators. Um, or you can you know, trace out X and get an operator on Y, and so you get something else in the other direction. So in this talk, we're sort of focused down here, but just know that it, it fits into a much larger story. Um, but for us, we're, we're gonna, um, I just wanna keep things sort of simple. Uh, and what's the sort of simple takeaway that I wanted to convey? Well, remember I said that, hey, these operators, I like to think of them as like the linear algebra version of marginal distributions. We well, can sort of see that in this picture that I've drawn, but there's a much more concrete way to see that. Um, okay, so this is just recapping what I said here. Um, think of reduced densities. Ah, by the way, um, the things up here are densities. And so if you sort of reduce to a smaller subsystem, you can think of this operator down here as a reduced version of that. So that's where that language comes from. So, th so here's the punchline. Uh, we want to think of reduced densities, these operators of this form, M dagger M or M M dagger. These are like marginal distributions in a linear algebraic sense. So this is more than intuition. You can actually see this really concretely. So if we were to look at the matrix representation, let's say the operator that's um, operating on X. So we've traced out Y and I have this operator on X. The diagonals, say the x, x diagonal entry, well, what is this? Well, I have two copies of the probability distribution. Um, this is matrix multiplication, so I'm summing over a common index, namely y. But this is exactly the marginal probability distribution on x. So this is what we saw in the example. Uh, and I'm just saying, hey, that, that was not a coincidence or not just like a nice scenario, but you can actually see this more generally. So this operator actually recovers marginal probabilities on its diagonal. But there's also extra information. As we saw in the example, there could be non-zero off-diagonal entries. Um, and so in general, they will be non-zero. I can compute it this way. I look uh, 
what's the x, x prime off diagonal entry? Well, it's just the same expression as above, except for now uh, one of my x's is an x prime. But still, I'm summing over um, all y. And so I've, I've said, look, these off diagonals know something about subsystem interactions. Why is that? Well, you can see from this expression, the off diagonal entry, x, x prime off diagonal entry of this matrix is telling me something about how x and x prime, two little elements in my set x, relate to each other given shared interactions in the complementary system y. So this um, in general will be non-zero if these probabilities are non-negative. And so uh, these off diagonals know something about the system that you're operating on x, but given um, shared interactions with elements in that set based on how they're interacting with elements in y, the complementary subsystem that you've traced out. And so I think that's really interesting because that's exactly the information you don't have access to when computing marginal probability in the usual way. Now, I could say a lot more about this. There's, there's um, a really nice sort of combinatorial way to understand this, but um, let me keep moving on. Um, here's an interesting point that I like to think about. Since I have this matrix, um, you know, here's my operator M dagger M, and I'm saying, hey, the diagonals are something we know, marginal probabilities, but there's this extra stuff in the off diagonal. What's that? Well, I'm, I can point to it and tell you what it is explicitly. You just compute this sum, but you know, intuitively, what is that? Or is there a more principled way to understand the extra information stored here? Is there? Um, the answer is yes. So I like to think of the extra information stored and the off diagonals of these reduced densities as akin to conditional probability. So I want to explain this sentence. And to do that, I'm going to need to take a slight detour and um, give you a proposition and, and sketch a little proof. And then once we have that uh, at hand, then I'm gonna come back and revisit this idea. Okay, so let me, for the moment, take a small detour and prove the following claim. Suppose you have any unit vector, I'm gonna call it psi, and the tensor product of Cx uh, tensor Cy. So, you know, you could think of psi as like um, uh, one of these unit vectors which are square roots of some classical probability distribution, but it doesn't have to be, but just any unit vector. And let M be the linear map associated to psi. So, you know, M is the rectangular array whose coefficients are uh, those from this vector, just like we did before. So here's the claim. Um, if I compose M with its adjoint in, in either direction, these two operators have the same spectrum. And moreover, there's a bijection between their eigenvectors. Okay, so I'd like to prove this claim and then we'll see how this relates to my statement about conditional probability. So here's the proof. I'm gonna start with my vector psi. Uh, I'm gonna use string diagrams rather than write this out. Uh, I think the pictures will be helpful. So let's start with our vector psi. So this is you know, in the tensor product of Cx and Cy. Um, we just noted that any vector in a tensor product corresponds to a linear map between the factors. So I'm viewing now M is just this node with an edge for each factor. Um, now recall any linear transformation, or if I think of M as, as the matrix representing this map, has a singular value decomposition. So I can write M, I can factor M as the product of a unitary operator followed by a diagonal followed by another unitary operator. Um, the columns of U and V are the left and right singular vectors of the matrix M. The non-zero diagonal entries of this operator D are the singular values of M. So I'm just doing an SVD factorization. Okay, that's like the setup. What, what, what was this, what are we trying to prove again? Well, uh, remember we are interested in the spectral information of M composed with this adjoint. So I just compute that. What is M dagger M? 
well, okay, I have a copy of M here. Uh, maybe it's adjoint is here, maybe M is here. Um, but each of these has a singular value decomposition. So here's an SVD, here's an SVD. But the light blue nodes, these are exactly V dagger V, these unitary, this unitary operator. So unitary says this is the identity. So those go away and so I'm just left with U, two copies of D and U dagger. So what this says is that, well, I guess I didn't give the, uh, the, uh, the definition, but um, density operators, a very important property of them is that they're self-adjoint, they're hermitian. And so this is actually a spectral decomposition, an eigen decomposition of this operator, M dagger M. So what this says is that, hey, the eigenvectors of this linear map are exactly the singular vectors of the original mapping M. And also the eigenvalues of this map are exactly the squares of the singular values of the original map M. Okay, now um, I have all of this white space over here and that's because I just wanted to remind you, remember this is part of some larger story. So what's really going on is that you're taking one of these orthogonal projection operators onto this uh, original unit vector you started with, call it psi. So psi is just this bottom node. And you can look at orthogonal projection onto it. And you can do this linear algebraic version of marginalizing, which is the partial trace. So you sort of contract um, out this space y. So you're left with an operator on x to x. But now you can imagine you just sort of pull these two strings tight. And so you're left with you know, a gray node, a gray node. And this is exactly m dagger m. So that's kind of like the behind the scenes. And so you can see, you know, here we traced out y, but you could also imagine starting over here and tracing out x. So now I'm left with an operator from y to y. So this now would be m, m dagger, and the rest of the stuff on this slide would be the same, but with light blue and dark blue sort of flipped. So here's the punchline. Um, we have what we wanted to claim. These two operators have the same spectrum namely the squares of the singular values of your original map M. And also uh, the left and right singular vectors are in one-to-one -one correspondence, but these are exactly the eigenvectors of these two operators. And so there's a bijection between their, their eigenvectors. And in fact, M provides that uh, bijection. You know, M sends um, you the i uh, right singular vector to the ith left singular vector, but scaled by the ith singular value. So M actually provides this bijection. All right, that's the um, end of the claim. Why did I bring this up again? Well, because I wanted to um, make this um, observation that extra information is akin to conditional probability. What extra information? Well, you'll remember. Um, if your matrix M or if your original vector psi that you're projecting onto is one of these obtained from a classical joint distribution, then this operator recovers marginal probabilities on its diagonal, but it also has this extra information stored in these non-zero off-diagonal um, uh, entries. Now, the presence of non-zero off-diagonal entries guarantees that this map has interesting spectral information. If this were just a diagonal matrix with zeros everywhere else, its eigenvectors would correspond exactly to your elements in your set X, and that's not really interesting. You haven't really done anything new. Um, but since there are non-zero entries here, you actually have interesting eigenvectors. So like linear combinations of elements in X. So I'd like to think of this extra information, it's like conditional probability. So why am I saying that? Well, um, now it helps to think back to basic probability theory. So um, we know how, how joint probabilities are related to uh, conditionals and marginals, namely in this way. So in light of this familiar fact, let me just state the obvious. If someone were to hand you marginal distribution, the marginal distributions on X and Y, you could not reconstruct the joint distribution given marginals alone. You also need to know something about conditional probabilities. Okay. 
However, here's what's interesting. If someone were to give you the um, linear algebraic or quantum analogs of marginal probability distributions, then that would be enough to reconstruct the linear algebraic or quantum version of joint probabilities. So, um, and that says that, well, uh, well, actually, let me not get ahead of myself. Let me tell you why that claim is true. And then I'll say, why does this, like, what does it have to do with conditional probability? So let me say, um, what happens if someone gives you the linear algebraic versions of joint probability, I mean, uh, of marginal probability? What is that really? Well, that's just exactly these um, operators M dagger M. So remember I said in this larger story, um, this operator is really like you're projecting onto a certain uh, a certain vector, um, and then you're tracing out or applying the linear algebraic version of marginalizing, and so I'm left with an operator on X. But we just saw in the previous proposition that this um, decomposes as a unitary, you know, a diagonal squared and another unitary. And same thing for my other operator, M, M dagger. So here's the point. Suppose you already had access to these eigenvectors and eigenvalues. If you have access to them, and generically speaking, you can then sort of line up their eigenvectors in this one-to-one -one correspondence um, and, and sort of glue them together so that you can reconstruct your original mapping M. But your original mapping M really is coming from one of these vector psi. I mean, they're really one and the same. And over here, once you have this original thing, you know, this is like the pure quantum state that you're starting with. This is like the original state of your system. Uh, but this vector psi exactly has the joint probabilities as its coefficients. And so that's interesting, huh? You can rebuild your original state if you just know something about the quantum versions of marginals. So here's the point. Since you can do that, and since these operators have actually marginals on the diagonals, and since they also have extra information, and that extra information is enough to reconstruct the original state, this extra information must be then akin to the only thing left in the equation, which is conditional probability. So I like to think of this extra information as like conditional probability. Um, in the example we saw um, at, at the beginning of the talk, you actually recover conditional probability on the nose. Um, Excuse me. <coughs> yeah. Excuse me. Um, did I, maybe I missed it. Did you say, are you saying that you can recover M from M dagger M and MM dagger? Yes. And was this a diagram supposed to have showed me how to do it? Like, how do I see, how do I figure out the, the dark triangle, yes. and the light Great. triangle from Thank the you. stuff on top? Exactly. Okay. So then the question is, hey, how do you compute these eigenvectors and eigenvalues so that you know how to reconstruct? Thank you for the segue, because I'm going to tell you that next. So in practice, how does one do this? Okay, so now this is the application part of my talk. So now I'm going to actually give you an algorithm that shows you how to do this. Um, so, so yes, that's the theory. Perfect segue. Um, you know, I, I was anticipating actually another question, which is why would one bother with this? Like, why would you take something really simple and easy to understand like probability distributions on finite sets and map that over to something more complicated like these things called density operators on possibly large dimensional spaces? So here's why. Um, so knowledge of how to, figuring out how to reconstruct a state given you know, information about smaller pieces of it suggests a new algorithm for reconstructing a joint probability distribution. And now here's the answer to John's question, given some samples. So um, let me connect this to a more applied setting. You can imagine a scenario in which you have some data generated from some possibly unknown probability distribution. And suppose you'd like to model that probability distribution so that you can generate new data from it. So this is like generative modeling in the language of machine learning. Um, that's sort of, now I can use these ideas to attack a problem like this. So let me describe how this works. And in describing an algorithm to do this, um, we'll see how we can actually build these spectral information of reduced densities. So here's kind of the main idea. 
I, I said, suppose you have some samples. Um, and, and what you want to do is uh, take these samples, which kind of define like an empirical probability distribution. It's not quite the one you want, but it's like a rough approximation to it. You use these samples to form one of these orthogonal projection operators. And then you look at reduced densities on small subsystems, and then you sort of glue their eigenvectors together. And this reconstructs a approximation of the state that you, that you actually want. So let me just give you um, a sort of sketch of the idea. So here are some samples. Um, we could think of these as the quantum particles, but actually this is a math talk. So I think it would be helpful to think of, um, think of each row as a sequence or an element in a Cartesian product of sets. Um, uh, and so, yes, I see a question. What do I mean by glue them together? I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get there. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so here's, here's kind of the, so I'm gonna think of each of these rows as an element in a Cartesian product. So I'm just gonna think of these as the sequences. And now what the algorithm says, um, what you wanna do is sort of hone in on a small subsystem. So I'm gonna hone in and zoom in onto the first two sites. And then I'm going to compute a reduced density operator, one of these things called MM dagger, on this small system. You could think of this now as X and think of the rest as Y. It's grayed out because we sort of traced it out. So now I have an operator on this X subsystem and I'm gonna collect its eigenvectors. Um, you know, if I, have, if I have an actual empirical probability distribution, I have my matrix M, I know how to do an, SV, uh, an SVD factorization so I can actually get these. So I just hold on to these eigenvectors. And then um, the next step of the algorithm is to expand your subsystem just a little bit. So I'm gonna add on one more site and then repeat the process. Compute one of these density operators on this small subsystem, collect its eigenvectors and just hold on to them. And then you expand, you do it again, um, you expand and do it again. Now let me just say, at each time, um, think of, Think of these eigenvectors as a bit like summaries, right? So we said that marginalizing is like a summarization, uh, but actually it's like a summarization of this small system, but given its interactions with this new extension of it. So these eigenvectors sort of know about the, these added on pieces. And so you keep on doing that and keep on doing that. And then at the end, you sort of glue them together. Now what I'm gonna do uh, in a few seconds is to, tell you explicitly what do I mean by glue. But first, let me um, say something that I've sort of swept un under the rug. I've swept uh, a lot under the rug, but I think this is an important piece. Um, a few slides ago, I said, hey, we compute these operators on small subsystems, but you can already see I'm expanding this, like my gray square is no longer small. So there's a step um, that I have omitted and it's, um, it's like an SVD truncation. So when I have these operators and I look at their eigenvectors, actually rather than taking all of the eigenvectors, I only take those corresponding to the top largest eigenvalues. So you set some threshold that you choose and then you only pick the eigenvalues um, associated to the eigen, eigenvectors associated to the eigenvalues above that threshold. So that keeps things small that keeps the rank of these operators small. And it also, you can think of this as like um, getting rid of the sampling errors. So this is really where the learning happens. Okay, and then at the end of the day, yeah, I'm saying, oh, you kind of glue these eigenvectors together. So what does that mean? So great, glad you asked. Let me now tell you in a more concrete way what I mean. So you kind of remember I'm saying, hey, we're starting with a pure quantum state orthogonal projection, a rank one density, and it's all based on a very particular vector. And so here's a picture of that vector. How do you actually get it? Um, this is the thing I've been calling psi. You have your samples. These define some empirical distribution. And so psi is essentially the sum of all of your samples weighted by the square roots of their empirical probabilities. So you have this vector, it's in a large dimensional space potentially. Now, you remember the first step of the algorithm? I said, quote unquote, zoom in to the first two sites. So what does zoom in mean? So here's the answer. What you do is 
you look at orthogonal projection onto psi. So I have two copies of psi. You can think of this as like psi, psi dual, or projection onto psi. Zooming in to the first two sites, which we could think of the, that as x, that corresponds to tracing out or doing this linear algebraic version of marginalizing the rest of the system. So technically, this is called the partial trace. So I'm applying the partial trace to get rid of this stuff y. So now this is exactly, you know, this is something like an operator of the form m dagger m. So this is one of the familiar things. Um, this turns out, I've been referring to this as a reduced density, so it turns out to be a density, it's Hermitian, and so it has a spectral decomposition. So I can look at, um, you know, this is like a unitary, maybe this is like d squared, but I'm just lumping the two yellow nodes as one times a unitary, it's adjoint. So I'm just looking at the spectral decomposition of this operator. And now remember, I said, hey, just, just collect the eigenvectors of this operator. So what that means really is, I'm just kind of sort of pick off this tensor. Now, it turns out that in, um, in a setting, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, we actually run this on a real data set. And so everything is totally, uh, like you can compute all of this and you actually get a tensor that you can, you know, like hold in your hand. So this is all, um, uh, it's not abstract or just in theory, but you can actually run an experiment. So you can really do this. Um, also, I like, I like to think of, remember I was saying that eigenvectors are like, these things are like summarizing this information about subsystems, and you can even see that in the picture. You can imagine this blue mapping, it like takes two pieces of information, and then it does something to them, and then it spits out a summary. And so here, to answer the question about gluing, what you do is you take that tensor, and you just compose it with your original vector psi. So, you know, I have a vector and a tensor product. I can think of it as a linear mapping between the factors. And so I can just pre-compose that linear mapping with my unitary. So that's what I mean by glue. So what happens is that I, knew, I get a new vector, call it psi two. So psi two is like, oh, it's like the state of my original system, but after I've summarized the first two sites. And then the rest of the algorithm says, okay, do the same thing again. Now you summarize the first two sites. Now just tack on a little bit of new information, uh, you know, trace out the rest and get a summary of this new two site system. And so that's what you do. You come over here and you repeat the process. You look at projection onto this modified vector, psi two with psi two. Um, you tr this is like your new subsystem X. You trace out the remaining stuff Y. This also has a spectral decomposition. Again, you think of the um, eigenvectors of this new map as like a summary of new information, uh, summarizing how it interacts with the previously summarized information from the other step, and then you keep on going. Okay, so what happens if you keep on doing this over and over and over again, you get um, what's called a tensor network decomposition of your original vector psi. So um, essentially what you've done is you've taken a, a vector in a, large in a tensor product of spaces, potentially large dimensional, and you've sort of done this um, SVD step at each stage, and you get a factorization of your original vector psi. Now this turns out also to be a unit vector. That means if you look at the square of its entries, it defines a probability distribution on your set of sequences. Um, or on your Cartesian product of which your sequences were a subset. And that probability distribution um, is really, really, really close to the original one, the target one, the one that you were trying to approximate, um, the one for which your empirical distribution was just uh, uh, an approximation. And so this is like you're reconstructing the original state, the original quantum state, just given a few samples um, or like an approximation of it. And so in the context of machine learning, this is like an unsupervised machine learning. Uh, this actually learns a, a difficult joint probability distribution very efficiently. So what I just described for you now is joint work with Miles Studenmeyer and John Trilla. Um, so we run this on a computer. Our data set um, is called the even parity data set. So our sequences are sequences of zeros and ones. And um, we try to learn a um, 
particular, it's actually a simple joint probability distribution on it. And it turns out this works very well, very efficiently. Um, you don't even need a lot of samples to do it. Um, and because it's all involving linear algebra, uh, quite simple linear algebra, we're even able to predict how well the model will perform, how good uh, of a unit vector this, this tensor network decomposition is, just given the fraction of samples that you use to train it. So even the theory allows you to make predictions about it. So this is the difficult joint probability distribution? Is it yeah. some new specific yeah. mathematical way to generate a probability distribution? Sorry. Um, you sort of sketched it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so there, so what I've just described for you is like a crash course in the algorithm. So the algorithm tells you how um, if you have some samples from a joint distribution that maybe you don't have access to, or maybe you do. Um, the, qu the question yeah. which I was trying to ask was, what is this famously difficult oh, joint probability great. distribution? Yeah, it's very easy. It's just, um, so consider all bit strings of a fixed length. I think we work with length 16. And look at the distribution that's uniformly concentrated on bit strings with even parity. So a bit string has even parity if it has an even number of ones. And so this is so simple to say, but it turns out it's like not easy to learn, but we learn it quite well. Okay, thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so uh, that, yeah. So now I wanna sort of change gears. I, I see it, I have a few minutes left. So I have mentioned nothing about category theory whatsoever, and now I wanna do that. So I wanna do that by asking a question, what happens if now we've replaced probabilities with possibilities? Um, what do I mean? Here, what have we done so far? Basically, we started with a matrix and we considered the eigenvectors of, or the one dimensional invariant subspaces, if you like, of the linear map M composed with its adjoint. And, and the question I wanna ask now is, what happens if we replace C, complex numbers or real numbers, whatever you like, with zero and one or truth values? And in an analogous way, what if we then consider the invariant subsets of the poset maps F and G composed with each other? Okay, what are these poset maps? This is, um, uh, these are the obvious maps that you get when you have a relation. So let me just describe this. By two to the X, I mean the power set of X. I'm just using that as notation. Um, and in any time you have a relation uh, on X and Y, you get a natural map from, X, from the power set of X to the power set of Y. I can take a subset of X and map it to the set of all things in Y that relate to every element in this set, subset A. And similarly, I can go in the other direction. If I have a subset of Y, I can map it to all elements in X that relate to every element in my set. I'm calling it B of Y. And so um, I've drawn this setup to look sort of similar to the linear algebra. Um, and, I, and I'm suggesting, hey, what happens if you look at subsets that are invariant under the composition, like this round trip composition? And I'm, I'm trying to say, hey, these are kind of like eigenvectors. Um, Maybe that might feel more true if F and G were, were adjoints in some sense, um, but you know they are, right? So I, I've just described for you a Galois connection, um, really. So the power set is a post set by subset inclusion. One can check that these maps are order reversing or contravariant functors and that they satisfy this relationship here. A is a subset of G of B, if and only if B is contained in F of A. Um, so um, here's what's interesting. Uh, suppose for a second you think about subsets A and B for which you not only get containment here, but you actually have equality. So suppose you have a pair A and B so that you have equality here. Um, then these are invariant subsets under the composition of F followed by G. For example, uh, you know, G F of A is G of B, if I have equality down here, but that's just A, 
And similarly, F G of B is equal to B. So subsets for which you actually have equality, they actually have a special name. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but I'm sort of saying, I'm trying to say that, hey, these are kind of like the eigenvectors a little bit, you know, they're invariant subsets. Now, if you wanted to write all of this down to sort of see why I'm thinking that the linear algebra is analogous to this, um, and to see these subset containments as actually HOM sets to get this adjunction, there are some ops involved. So I'm, I'm really omitting the details, but I can't resist saying this. Um, I can't resist pulling back the curtain just a little bit and saying what's really going on behind the scenes is a discussion about free co-completions. So um, let me give uh, a, a brief taste of what I have in mind. So um, let me just say, uh, let me focus on this line for a second. What have we done so far? Well, we started with a particular function, x cross y into c, and we noted that that function, well, it's a matrix, and so it corresponds to a linear map between the factors. And if you look at um, com composing that map uh, with its adjoint, then like the eigenvectors or the fixed points of these operators are pretty interesting. In a completely analogous way, rather than starting with a function, you can start with a profunctor. So suppose you have small categories C and D, um, and you look at a profunctor C out cross D into set. Now, if you do that, just like in the linear algebra case, you get a, a, a linear map and its adjoint. In this categorical version, um, any profunctor gives rise to an adjunction between pre-sheaves on C and co-pre-sheaves on D. Now, let me not um, describe for you how this adjunction is defined. I'll uh, connect it to something that might be for more familiar in a second. Um, but uh, you, you can kind of think of this as analogous to, you know, like, if you start with a set, you can't really add your elements. So you take the free vector space, so formal linear combinations of them. So I'm saying analogously, if you start with a, a small category C, um, you can take what's called, it's not the free vector space, but the free co-completion, the free co-completion of your category C, and that coincides with pre-sheaves. Um, the free completion corresponds with uh, op, um, op co-pre-sheaves and so forth. Uh, so in some sense, pre-sheaves are like vectors, you know, profunctors are like matrices. There's even a way to see that representable functors are like basis vectors. Um, there's a really nice dictionary between linear algebra and category theory um, that you see when unwinding this. If you don't know about it, I highly suggest reading or asking someone. Um, I've written all, all of this is in chapter five of my thesis if you're interesting, interested in it. Um, let me just say quickly, if D is actually the same category C, and if your profunctor that you start with is the HOM functor, then this adjunction uh, sometimes is called the ISPEL adjunction. And what you can do is you can look for pre-sheaves, um, pre which after you map them in this direction and send them back, um, ask for those pre-sheaves that are naturally isomorphic to their image under this round trip composition. So the subcategory of those pre-sheaves, they're called the ISPEL completion of your category C. So maybe that might be familiar um, to some folks. But, you know, more generally, we can say, hey, what if we have any category D and any profunctor, and then kind of ask for the same scenario. All right, you won't be surprised to know that you can also replace set with any sufficiently nice enriching category. Um, truth, truth values, it turns out, um, it, it is an example of a sufficiently nice, uh, we can be precise if we want, enriching category. So now I really am letting two be this uh, category with zero and one and one non-trivial morphism between this. So this turns out to be an example of enriching category. You can view finite sets as posets enriched over truth values. Just think of them as discrete posets. And so subsets of X really are like pre-sheaves, subsets of Y are like co-pre-sheaves. And when you work out this Isbell adjunction in this more generalized setting, um, you exactly get these, these maps F and G that we had on the previous slide. And so what you can do is that you can look for, uh, you know, pre-sheaves or subsets that are fixed under the composition. I mentioned before, these have a name, they're called formal concepts. So here's just the sort of down to earth um, summary of all of that 
categorical stuff. So what is a formal concept? It's a pair, um, it's a subset A of X and a subset B of Y such that F of A equals B and G of B equals A. Now, why are they called concepts? Well, typically, um, typically it's helpful to think of X as a set of objects and Y as a set of attributes. And then a formal concept is like a maximally defined uh, Maybe I shouldn't use the word concept, but it's like a concept. So you can think, okay, a formal concept has the property that all objects in my set A possess every attribute in B. And then in the same way, each attribute in B is possessed by all of the objects in A. And so one could get really deep into this. It turns out that formal concepts themselves are a pose set. They actually turn out to be a lattice. And so this leads into formal concept analysis, um, which uses, um, lattice theory to understand concept hierarchies and data. So we could get deep into that direction, but I don't have much time left. So I just want to focus on this one aspect, namely that formal concepts kind of look a lot like eigenvectors in some sense. Um, they're sort of like fixed under a map with its adjoint. So the sort of climax for the talk then is I want to show you how in some cases these literally do coincide with eigenvectors of precisely the operators we've been talking about so far. So um, to show you that, I want to give you an example, but first, just to make it easier, I like to think um, in terms of pictures. And so you can think of a relation as a bipartite graph. You know, I have X vertices and Y vertices, and there's an edge between them if they're related, and there's not an edge otherwise. And in this um, understanding, a formal concept is a maximal complete bipartite subgraph. So the subgraph in blue is an example of a formal concept. The subgraph in black is not. So why do I mention that? Because here's an example. So this might look familiar. Here's a relation or a picture of one. Um, and it has two formal concepts. I mean, these coincide precisely with the um, components of my graph. And, and you can sort of imagine this. I have a subset orange and green. And my, uh, I can send this to everything they're related to. That's fruit. And then if I ask, hey, what is fruit related to? Well, I get exactly what I started with. So I have two formal concepts. Um, the pear orange green fruit, maybe that's like the concept of citrus fruit. Um, and the pear purple vegetable, maybe this is like purple cauliflower or purple asparagus. Um, why do I mention this? Well, if you remember our opening example, I hope that you'll see that these two formal concepts exactly coincide with the two eigenvectors of our reduced density operators from the very beginning. So if you remember, um, we had this three by three matrix M, sorry, M dagger M, and its eigenvectors um, were essentially the normalized sum of orange and green. So I'm kind of thinking there's a way to be precise that orange and green are um, correspond to orthonormal bases standard basis vectors. And so what we're really looking at is the normalized sum of them. And you remember that eigenvector was like a conditional distribution, given that the colors we were describing, the colors we're describing fruit. So in fact, fruit turns out to be an eigenvector of the other operator. And so under that one-to-one -one correspondence here, uh, these two eigenvectors are like a better version of the formal concepts. They're like an enriched, uh, a statistically enriched version. Um, and same thing down here. Um, Okay, before you get excited, let me just say this is not always true. So it is not always the case that eigenvectors of reduced density operators of a pure quantum state defined in the way I have in this talk, um, it's not true that they always coincide with formal concepts. It's very um, important that this graph here can be written as a disjoint union of um, complete bipartite subgraphs. So as soon as that fails, like if I were to add an edge here, you'd see that the eigenvectors and the formal concepts um, don't agree. But yet, I, I hope I've um, tried to convey in this talk that even though maybe they don't coincide always, still these eigenvectors, at least in the linear algebra case, do capture some interesting statistical type um, concepts uh, that are even useful in a more applied setting. So um, I'm going to end the talk here. Uh, because I, I see it's 201. So let me just say, um, to wrap up, uh, by way of analogy, what do I mean? Well, I don't know of a way to view 
probabilities or um, the complex numbers or the reals as an enriching category so that the category theory subsumes the linear algebra. So, so far, this is just an analogy. Um, I'm sort of giving you an analogy of an, app, an application on the linear algebra side of this analogy. In some cases, they kind of co coincide. But the point is that, um, you know, if we exchange set for truth values in that pro functor discussion, um, you know, you get formal concepts. And if we take it a step further and by way of analogy, substitute truth values for probabilities, then you get something new, namely um, what I've discussed in this talk. Now, it turns out that there's more. There's a lot more you can do in context of natural language, but I think I'm going to have to leave this as a cliffhanger and uh, I'll stop here. Great. Thanks very much for the end of your talk was creating a huge flood of questions and enthusiasm. Okay, great. Uh, so let's see. I don't, I wish I could rapidly uh, enable people to ask their questions, but Christian said, question for the end, does reconstructing the probability distribution from the two reduced density matrices work if we do a tensor decomposition into three instead of two vector spaces? So is there like a tri-part, tri, a three-way version of this thing? Um. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure how that would work. Um, I mean, if you, mm -hmm. like, when you're marginalizing, there's like a left and a right, you know, um, you have a joint distribution. And so by default, you're starting with like a bipartite sort of system. And so um, there's like, uh, so I'm not sure at the moment, but maybe, I, I don't know, uh -huh. Do people like marginalize the left, the right and the middle. <laughs> I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I'm it not sure. That's a great fun. question, Christian. Um, at the moment, I, I haven't thought too much about that, though. So Alex Kissinger had a question. So he said, another simple way to approximate a state by a tensor network is to do a sequence of singular value decompositions and just throw away small values as you go. Does your algorithm refine this, or is it completely different? I think it's exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm not, uh, so I don't know exactly what Alex Kissinger has in mind, although, um, although here I've taken my vector psi, written it as this. Sorry. Um, oh, hold on, hold on a sec. Sorry. I, sorry, Ty, I accidentally, I accidentally Hi. muted me. Okay. Phew. Okay. I'm back. Okay. So um, I don't know where I got cut off. However, it's um, my fault. this, yeah, no problem. This tensor network factorization has a name. It's called a matrix product state. Um, a matrix product state uh, is like almost by definition, a factorization you get by viewing your, your original vector psi as a linear map, um, like on this space as the domain or this space is the domain, or this space is the domain, and so forth. And at each iteration, you, v you take a singular value decomposition of that linear map, and you're collecting the top singular vectors. Those top singular vectors uh, comprise, a, comprise a tensor, and these are exactly those tensors. So this is like a truncated SVD at each step, and you're just like harvesting the benefits along the way. So to me, it sounds like it's exactly uh -huh. um, questions are streaming in. You may be able to look at your chat window now, Ty, because it's hard for me to keep up, up myself. You could like pick. Okay, Arthur down. says, hi, Arthur. Um, two questions. We saw formulas for the distributions on X and Y from M dagger M and the other one. Is there actually a formula for the conditional probabilities from the off diagonal entries? Great question. The answer is no. So this is why throughout the talk, I have, um, at least I don't have a formula. So this is why I am using this um, carefully chosen word of akin to conditional probability or tantamount to conditional probability, because I don't know a way to um, 
other than very like very specific examples, kind of like how formal concepts coincided with eigenvectors in the super simple case. So you do get conditional probabilities and you can write them out explicitly in terms of the entries of the eigenvectors, but only in super, super simple like toy examples or toy scenarios. So maybe it's not helpful. Um, so that's why I've been saying, hey, it's like, it's akin to conditional probability. Um, the other question is, if someone hands you such density matrices, can you tell when they arose from a classical distribution by looking at the off-diagonal terms? Well, I would say, uh, if those off-diagonal terms were real numbers and non-negative, I might think, hey, this came from a classical distribution. Um, if there are any negative numbers in the diagonal or uh, possibly complex numbers, that's, I mean, it wouldn't. Um, that's as refined as I can get right now. Um, maybe there are other questions. Should I ask? Uh, um, there, there are, Sorry. Yeah, there, there are questions. Um, here's one. I don't. Do you know what eigenvectors correspond to in the set or the two enriched case? I'm not completely sure I understand that question, but I guess it's about and following up on the analogy that you. Uh, yeah. yeah. What do eigenvectors? So. Um, so. What do eigenvectors correspond to in the two enriched case? So I would say that the analog for these eigenvectors in the truth enriched case are formal concepts. Um, so I tried to make that analogy by saying, hey, uh, this is like the sort of Isbell adjunction generalization that you get, which is a little bit mirrors the linear algebra setup. Um, and in the truth enriched case, you get formal concepts. That's probably as much as I would say. I think the answer is probably formal concepts. There was just a new question. Okay, uh, from yep. Brian. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, with respect to your previous work relating these quantum probabilities to word frequency in corpus, what is the formal concepts in that example? Um, Let's see. Uh, so I'm not quite sure I understand that question, but it, let me try to um, guess about maybe um, maybe what Brian is getting at. So maybe the question is like, yeah, can you actually pick out concepts from text data? You know, given these sort of tools that you're using here, and in, in formal concepts come into play. So that's related to the end of my talk, which I did not get to. So let me just say. Um, I am very hopeful that there is a way that one can use these tools to, yes, pick out concepts in, in text data using the statistics in text. This is something I, I, I wanted to get to at the end, so let me just like briefly answer this question. Um, you can use the tools in this talk to explore um, structure in natural language, um, mathematical structure in natural language, one thing you can do is you kind of, you can kind of, um, I don't know, let the statistics serve as a proxy for meaning in language, and then um, think of like the network of ways that one word like orange fits into all other expressions in your language. And actually what that allows you to do is use the ideas in my talk to see, to like map words to precisely these density operators, things of the form M dagger M this turns out to be an example of that. And you can actually map words to density operators and get things like entailment or hierarchy in language. So you can actually see, hey, there's a simple post-set structure on language. It allows you to see things like orange is more general than ripe orange, which is more general than small ripe orange. So um, yes, you can, you can continue to use these ideas to explore ideas and meanings in language. And, and it's very compatible with everything else that I've talked about. I hope that's sort of an answer. Um, right, and I should say, actually, the thing I've mentioned here uh, about densities and, and language, this is um, uh, work in progress with Yanis Vlasopoulos, and so we're working on a paper on this right now. It'll be in the archive, I hope, in a few weeks. So uh, whoever asked that question, I think, Brian, um, hang on to your seat because it's coming. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, other questions? Oh, sorry, I see Simon has a hand raise. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so Simon is muted. Maybe John, could we unmute Simon? Uh, John is also muted. I can't hear anyone. I believe Simon can unmute. No. Um, but if not, well, I'm, Simon Stolza, is that who you mean? Simon Wilston, who I think oh. is Simon Willerton. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> right. um, I'm looking at, let's see, sorry, I'm, ah, I'm trying to go through Simon's. I only see one Simon. I believe, Simon, you can unmute yourself, whoever you are, and ask a question at this point. I tried to make it possible. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, oh, that's you. Okay, yeah, I see you there, that's weird. Ah, uh, okay, you're now unmuted. Plenty. Right. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so I, I think we spoke a little bit about this last year, but I was just wondering, um, so the people who've done uh, fuzzy concept analysis with, uh, so enriching over uh, sort of fuzzy truth values from sort of zero, one instead of, instead of truth. I mean, have you any thoughts on connections with that? Yes, so I thought very deeply about this. Um, in fact, I really enjoyed your student's thesis, um, Jonathan Elliott, I think. Yeah, so yeah. that's a fantastic thesis. I really love it. That makes great connections. Um, yeah, formal concepts, fuzzy concepts, even with like tropical geometry, fantastic. Um, I, so there, um, there, there's a discussion about generalized metric spaces. You can even view probabilities as an enriching category where, um, the internal HOM sets are like a nice truncated division. Um, the only thing about that is I don't see a way. So in that case, I think it's pretty easy to write down examples where um, um, eigenvectors in the linear algebra case like deviate, really deviate from the, the enriched pre unit in that sort of fuzzy scenario. Um, and so there's like a similarity for quite a while and then the things kind of diverge. Um, and in particular, the linear algebra is like its own beast and then the fuzzy concepts are like their own beast. And like maybe they coincide. And again, these like really simple and unhelpful cases. Um, but then also that makes me think, hey, actually maybe there's something else going on uh, that's also interesting that could connect to this. I just don't know. I, I have read into that and I haven't seen yet um, if there's a way to sort of make these things fit together in a, in a supernatural way. But I do know that it's like really easy to write down examples where you can see, whoa, these things are totally different. But yeah, they're capturing different things in kind of a unique way. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, well, maybe as a little bit of an advert. Yeah. So it's, uh, my talk in two weeks time, I'll be talking about some of the things, uh, these sort of pro function nuclei in, in other enriched cases. So. Great. Nice. So you've done a nice sort of uh, yeah introduction to some of the yeah. stuff. Well, thank, I I should say also um so for anyone who's who's interested and in, tantalized by this connection between linear algebra category theory um, Isabel completions uh, the first place I saw this written out really nicely was in a fantastic blog post by Simon um, on the in category cafe. I, I it was fantastic exposition. So thank you for writing it. Um, I think it's called just the nucleus of a pro functor. I think if you Google that, it'll be like the first. Um, the first link you see. So anyone who wants to read that, really great. So thanks, Simon, for writing that. Um, other questions? Hey, David Meyer had a question. He says, formal concept analysis is notorious for requiring algorithms with exponential complexity. Is there something in your approach that is finding some approximation in polynomial time? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's a great question. So right, yes. One of the... Uh, perks of working with tensor networks is that you have these very nice um, low rank approximations, which means things are very computable um, and doable. I haven't, um, I'm not really saying that I have an algorithm that computes formal concepts. Um, what I am saying is that I'm, I have an algorithm that can uh, like find a tensor network factorization for a particular vector. And along the way you get eigenvectors that are like formal concepts. So let me not um, say anything about 
let me not claim that I have something that can compute formal concepts in a, in a like much faster time. Um, but but on the other side of things, um, yes, uh, tensor networks are are one of their um, I guess main uh, advantages is that they do allow you. They're much more. They're very efficient for computing things. Um, I hope that was sort of an answer. Cole Comfort has a question. He says, I know that disco cat people use density matrices to try to model semantic ambiguity. Is there any relation between both of your approaches? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's definitely a connection. Um, let me say one thing that's different between what I'm doing and disco cat. You'll notice I mentioned nothing about um, grammar. Um, and so one of the features of disco cat is that uh, we're both using ideas of compositionality. Um, but in DiscoCat, you, you kind of have a functor from like a syntax grammar category into your semantics category with vector spaces. Um, but think of what I'm doing as like something that just lives only in the vector space world. So in other words, um, like one way you get these meaning vectors for text is that you um, sort of look in their environment and, and do these co-occurrences, and then you can glue them back together using grammar. But what I'm advocating is just like, hey, what happens if we just stay there? Where the statistics are and the linear algebra is. So that's one difference between the two approaches. Um, one similarity though, um, as you mentioned, um, you can, so in the disco cat work and um, I, uh, so one of the papers with Martha, I think I saw Martha here, um, they're using density operators to model something like ambiguity and actually what you get is entailment. Um, entailment or hierarchy, things like this, you know, I was saying orange is, is, is a more general version of a ripe orange and so forth. So there is some overlap here because I'm telling you, hey, you can do something very similar here. Um, what's nice is that you can actually weight these operators by conditional probabilities. And so you get a natural measure of entailment strength. Um, and so um, you might say uh, that at the end of the day, you can kind of do two uh, similar things using similar tools, um, but maybe the way that we approach them is, is a little bit different, but uh, you can also do some things that are uh, quite similar too. I had a question connected to that. You mentioned in passing during your talk that the uh, formal concept people study the lattices that you get with this, this entailment relation. Is there some nice place to learn a bit about that for someone who likes Yes, yes. Math? Yeah, so there's a, a seminal book on this topic, which I don't remember the name now. I think one of the authors is Priestley. Um, if someone knows this, please feel free to type it in the chat. I can look, look it up really quick, uh, or I could send it to you after. There's a great book. Um, you could send it to me afterwards, or I can look around for okay. pieces. It's so probably someone will like, probably know. It's probably like Introduction to Formal Concept Analysis, but I don't remember, but I could send it to you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, that's probably good enough. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a new, another question here. Okay, is there any hope of converting an arbitrary context into the linear algebra setup so that you can apply your algorithm. I see, right. So a context is the name for uh, a relation uh, that defines one of these formal concepts. So the question is, can you convert that into your linear algebra setup? Yes, here's one way that you can do that. So, um, oops, so earlier, remember I said, hey, a, uh, a relation is a bipartite graph, right? So here's an example of a relation. It has three edges. This is like the zero one version. Is there a, an edge, yes or no? And the question is, hey, can you convert this into the linear algebra scenario and then like do the analogous thing and then see what you get? And um, one way that I would do that is to consider the joint probability distribution on um, this subset of vertices that's uniformly concentrated on these three edges. So there are six elements in this set, like a color paired with a food. So there's six options, but only three of them have edges. So I have a relation, but I can actually enrich this over probabilities by saying, oh, well, you know, just, just the probability of a pair is one over the number of edges if that pair has an edge and it's zero otherwise. And then you can proceed and then if you do that, you get exactly these operators we've been talking about. 
so far. And then there, like, yeah, they coincide. They do recover the formal concepts um, in some cases. But if you were going to try to do this with a graph that looks like this, this is now no longer um, a disjoint union of complete bipartite subgraphs. And that actually turns out to be very important. So as soon as you do this, there's like this weird, I don't know, it's like information is now channeled from one component to the other. And then suddenly everything gets really murky and things are like fuzzy in the non-technical sense. And then formal concepts turn out not to coincide with the eigenvectors. But the eigenvectors are still useful. Okay, are there any other questions? It seems that that fuzzy situation is the generic situation when you have huge amounts of data and you're not going to get precise formal concept analysis done in a precise mathematically beautiful way using without uh, real numbers <laughs> won't really be able to cut it so you need some way to to do something more or uh, numerical to eliminate sort of weak links between things yeah. I think we should thank Ty Dene again, although people seem to still be, okay, no, they're not asking more questions just now. So that's a good time to thank Ty Dene. Great talk. Thanks. Uh, and we can uh, go over to Zulip. And uh, by the way, the references that I asked her have already been given. Great, chat. okay, thanks everyone. So that's thanks. fine. Okay. Thank okay. you for coming. Everybody's okay. silently clapping. <laughs>